I this conference will now be recorded. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you very much for having me. So, um, as you mentioned, um, the IPPC have said that climate change is affecting every region across the globe. And we are looking at um, warming of temperatures globally between one and two degrees. And it is highly likely that during the next 20 years, we will start to witness an increase in occurrence in extreme events. And these are events such as Storm Dennis and Storm Chiara, which um, affected Wales quite severely in um, early 2020. The IPCC are highly confident that projected increase in rainfall volume and intensity will mean an increased runoff in northern high latitudes due to the upland topography of the region, and especially during the winter, and that we'll see uh, precipitation extremes uh, that will increase almost everywhere. Therefore, our core valley lines in Wales, um, which are the South East Wales Valley region, will probably become increasingly exposed to increasingly uh, severe and frequent precipitation events, especially in urban, more urbanised areas, so such as Pontypridd, where we saw the flooding last year. Heavy precipitation is likely to result in heightened risk of surface water flooding across the core valley lines, and such events pose a threat to our infrastructure, our stations, equipment failure, passenger and staff safety, service reliability and reputation, to name a few. If rivers within the valley catchment area exceed capacity, river flooding will pose further risk to our assets and operations. So the IPP report highlighted that compound flood events will be particularly prevalent across northern European coasts um, as the climate warms. Uh, so these sorts of flooding um, are made up of a combination of sea level rise and extreme um, rainfall and storms, and the flooding can come from uh, surface water and river flooding as well. Areas like Cardiff Bay uh, are at risk of compound flooding, as well as other coastal networks in Wales. Cardiff uh, itself is uh, one of the top 10 cities in the world um, that will be most at risk of um, from sea level rise. Protecting coastal networks and stations through the installation and upgrading of coastal defences will not be the responsibility of Transport for Wales alone, and this work will require diligent collaboration. And we work with our key stakeholders, including the Welsh Government, Network Rail, Natural Resources Wales, to ensure our coastal networks are protected. Global warming of more than two degrees will likely result in more frequent and intense heatwave events. The recent UK climate change risk assessment states that it's likely that by uh, 2080, summer temperatures of 40 degrees will be exceeded as frequently as 32 is today. Temperatures of uh, 40 degrees are less are likely to present uh, severe risk or consequences for our asset, uh, so such as rail buckling and equipment failures, but also risks to our passengers and staff. It's likely that in the case of such an event, services will be inoperable, and vulnerable populations will be at the highest risk of ill health. We mustn't forget the social impact um, that these sorts of temperatures can have. If global warming exceeds the levels assessed by the IPCC, it's likely that the projected summer heat waves and heavy precipitation events during winter will be much worse in severity and frequency than they're currently estimated. Such events could result in catastrophic impacts on our networks, particularly for power, digital communication, transport and water supply. Impacts such as fluvial, pluvial and coastal flooding may breach tolerance at thresholds of rail assets, leading to worsening levels of damage and rail disruption. So the risks that climate change currently presents for our core valley line network in Wales are risks to the rail infrastructure due to river and surface water flooding, risks to track and stations due to coastal flooding and erosion, particularly in Cardiff, Risks to rail network due to slope embankment failures and or sub, uh, subsidence and risks to rail track and equipment from temperature extremes, high winds and lightning. There are also risks of cascading failures onto the rail network due to power outages and loss of digital connectivity, particularly as the um, network is now switching uh, to overhead electrification. Transport for Wales Sustainable Development Plan makes a commitment to adopt a low carbon impact strategy, and that plan was released in 2019. We're looking to minimise the greenhouse emissions that arise from the provision of our services. And I've summarised this below. 
the strategy outlines our ambitious decarbonisation programme, which includes upgrading our rolling stock. We've already removed um, 17 PACERs, PACER trains uh, from our network. 11 of these were recycled to be used as uh, community facilities. We electrified 172 kilometres, or we're electrifying 172 kilometres of track across the core valley lines. We've also been lowering track in some areas for the electrification, and we've been installing new drainage and clearing culverts to prevent flooding. In Aberdare, this has resulted in flooding events that have gone from five or six days to just a couple of hours. We're developing the South Wales Metro, really integrating the public transport options to help people move away from private vehicles onto public transport and to use active travel as well. We're installing electric vehicle charging points in new car parks that we install, but we've also been working with the Welsh Government on their electric vehicle charging strategy for Wales. And we're currently installing 21 uh, electric vehicle charging points across the rapid charge network. We're working in rural areas with Swarco to do this. We procure 100% of our electricity from renewable sources currently. This means that each station across the network is on a, on a renewables contract. But going further than this, we want to ensure that we're generating electricity ourselves. And so uh, we have a target for 2025 to achieve 50% of our renewables energy generated here in Wales. So we're looking at the rollout of a programme of the installation of uh, solar photovoltaic panels on at least 20 station buildings. We're also working with Network Rail where we can procure energy from solar panels they've installed on their buildings. As well as this, we're now working with the Welsh Government Energy Service to look at how we can utilise uh, community renewable projects to help us to make our stations um, off grid. And this means that the local communities to our stations will benefit from income that uh, we're paying them for their energy. To support the delivery of our decarbonisation aims, we're developing a costed plan to achieve net zero carbon emissions for all our direct operations by 2030. This is a Welsh government target and it's um, apply applicable to all Welsh public bodies. It is well ahead of the Welsh government target to achieve um, net zero by 2050. Our costed plan to decarbonise will support Welsh government to achieve their targets, mitigating emissions from the third largest emitting se sector. Transport currently makes up around 17% of Welsh emissions, with rail uh, making up around 1% of those. The first step of our work includes the assessment of our baseline carbon emissions where a series of carbon reduction targets were generated. Our current carbon footprint is uh, 78 megatons, and we are um, working to reduce this. Over the past three years, we've reduced our carbon footprint by 19%. Where we're committed to limiting future climate change through delivery of our decarbonisation aspirations. The latest IPCC report does emphasise there's a need to accept that climate change is happening and we need to prepare accordingly. We have a duty to respond and ensure our networks and operations are adapted to enable climate resilience and that we're minimising threats to health and safety, travel disruption and damage to assets and equipment. Our remit letter that we received from Welsh Government outlines a requirement for us to ensure that our operations are delivered um, based upon the latest climate data and that climate risk uh, and impact and climate change adaptation plans are in place. In August 2021, we recruited a climate risk and resilience lead to be the lead for climate change related activities, including both climate risk and adaptation. Their role will be to engage with the infrastructure owner team and Amy Infrastructure Wales to ensure a full assessment of climate risk is undertaken on our core valley lines. Further engagement with project leads will take place to ensure comprehensive assessment of climate risk is conducted for all of our projects too. Whilst we're committed to addressing climate change risks through adaptation and planning, it will nevertheless come with considerable challenges. It's possible that during the next 20 years, we will start to witness an increase in the occurrence of extreme weather events in Wales, such as Storm Dennis. This storm in particular brought unprecedented levels of rain to the valleys, and the highest number of flood warnings ever recorded by Natural Resources Wales. 
The Climate Change Committee also highlighted the risk of cascading failures poses considerable threat to the resilience of our network due to the interconnectedness of our infrastructure providers and the growing reliance on electrification to support our net zero emissions. It is essential to ensure that our net zero and decarbonisation commitments are intrinsically linked with adaptation investments viewed through a net zero lens and climate risk assessed for all of our decarbonisation projects. The cost of notable events such as the collapse of the Dawlish Seawall ran into the tens and hundreds of millions, which draws attention to the need to ensure that the uh, tra rail track currently exposed to climate risk in Wales is sufficiently protected to withstand future climate hazards. Collaboration between Transport Wales and Welsh Government, public sector organisations and other infrastructure network providers will be crucial to make sure that complex risks are assessed and their impact minimised and that we have the means to finance and deliver climate change adaptation. We've been asked frequently about the cost of climate change adaptation, but we need to realise that the cost of mitigating may be much, much higher. I've included a link here to a news article that was featured on the uh, news on Wednesday. I'm not going to play yet. I'm going to try at the end just in case it doesn't work. I'm going to move on to my next slide. So how are we planning to minimise the impact of climate change? So we collaborate with our infrastructure operations team to undertake climate change risk assessments on our core valley lines. We also work with project leads to ensure our projects have been assessed for potential climate risks. We ensure opportunities for adaptation are in, identified and included into project and engineering plans. And we're developing our adaptation plan, which sets out our vision to ensure the organisation is prepared for and resilient to the threat of climate change in everything that it does. The Welsh Government Low Carbon Plan was due to be released, uh, version two is due to be released in November. In there, it sets out a number of uh, targets for us to achieve transport sector emission reduction, including behavioural change measures. Transport for Wales plays a really important role in enabling modal shift from private vehicle to more sustainable travel. We also need to increase the uptake of electric vehicles and reduce emissions from road and rail transport through vehicle and fuel efficiency. Our targets are zero, uh, net zero for taxis 2028, net zero for buses in 2028 and net zero for uh, rail operations in 2030. And we're also looking at innovation to achieve decarbonisation. So this includes this shelter. We're working with an organisation based in Swansea called Specific. It's part of Swansea University and is funded by Tata Steel. We took one of our Voyager shelters and we donated it to Specific. It's currently in situ on uh, Baglin Industrial Estate. It's had a thin film solar panel affixed to the roof and battery storage uh, inside. And to this shelter, we'll be able to attach um, information boards, advertisement boards, uh, LED lighting and a motorised door. And this will be a completely off-grid shelter, completely running itself. It's in test at the moment. And so far, the um, outcomes have been really positive, showing that this uh, shelter should operate through winter months without any issue. It's a really positive step towards us on a zero target. As well as this, we've also been working with an organisation called Riding Sunbeams, who won a significant amount of money in a grant from the Rail Standards and Safety Board. The project is looking at how we can use trackside solar panels to feed into the overhead electrification. Uh, this shows a third rail electric, uh, this image shows a, a third rail electrification. So we're currently looking at uh, an AC to DC converter as opposed to DC to DC converter, I'm working on a project to create that technology, which doesn't currently exist in the size that we need it. These solar panels fed into our overhead electrification would reduce the risks that are posed by the threat of loss of um, power due to uh, flooding events or climate change events. We have identified that potentially 36% of uh, power could be uh, generated by solar panels on the core valley lines. It's a little late for this project, uh, but we'll definitely be approaching this for our North Wales and South West Wales Metro. And in the future, 
possibly we could start looking at retrofitting solar into our core value line project. Lloyd Newydd, the Wales Transport Strategy, sets out five key areas where we need to make substantial process, progress. This includes reducing greenhouse gas emissions and other environmental impacts, improving public transport and better integration between the different types, improving links and access between key settlements and sites, enhancing international connectivity and increasing safety and security. Transport for Wales will play a key role in ensuring that this happens. We're one of the key partners in the delivery of Lloyber Newydd. If you haven't seen this document yet, really worth a read. I'm going to go back now to my previous slide to see if I can play my uh, video for you. This includes uh, a recent update from a number of our partners on what we're doing in Wales to address climate change. Please let me know if you can't hear it. Are you able to hear it all? Sorry. No, we're not, Natalie. What you'd need to do is stop sharing and share and include media, and then the sound should come through. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. You hear now, sorry. No, there's no no sound at the moment, uh, Natalie. So. No, sorry about that. It doesn't look like the sound's going to work on this video. Sorry about that. And um, that was the end of um, my presentation slides. Um, I shall make sure that the um, video is shared in the chat for you. Um, and I suppose I'd like to hand over now to Andy to see if there's any questions. Right. Well, um, I'm going to start off with one question, if, if I may. Um, and then we'll, we'll take some more as they come in. So there's some 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 really interesting um, stuff there. How do you think we're going to uh, um, get better integration between the, the all various key organisations in Wales? Um, I mean, clearly, um, yeah, when we're talking about improving coastal defences, there are places where you know. We are the coastal defence uh, as the railway, but other places we're reliant on others. So how, how are we going to integrate that within the plan? So um, we're working closely with um, Network Rail, obviously, with most of the asset in Wales being uh, owned and, and managed by um, Network Rail. Where they're our key partner. Um, and the relationship that we have with um, natural resources Wales is also extremely important in that. Um, we work under the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act as a public body ourselves. And one of the key uh, ways of working in that plan is involvement and collaboration. Uh, and my role is to embed that piece of legislation into our organisation. So I hope that um, that that message is really uh, coming through in the work that we're doing. That uh, you know it's really important for us to work together. This is a big issue, um, which will need lots of uh, important players in to to address it. And um, yeah, I think the realization of of what could happen now and the costs that could likely occur uh, will be a key driver in enabling that relationship to happen. 
Yeah, I, th I think it's a case of the sooner you start, the easier it's going to be as well, isn't it? I think, yeah. So, well, we've got a couple more questions come in. Um, so, so Ed Green is asking, um, PACERS converted to community assets. What did this entail? Yeah, so our PACER trains were um, actually leased from um, a private company and at the end of their life, instead of uh, sending them for disposal, we decided that um, what we'd really like to do is, um, you know, something where they were moved from that sort of, uh, it's the waste hierarchy, good old waste hierarchy, reduce, reuse and recycle. Um, so instead of wasting them, we wanted to look at opportunities not, not to throw them away, basically. Um, so we have community engagement officers uh, within Transport for Wales and they worked really closely with um, the company who owned the Pacers um, to identify community groups and these included heritage railway groups as well, uh, not just community organisations. Um, and we um, handed over um, 11 Pacers, uh, so they were working units um we ensured that the organizations had a hard standing that they could be placed on um they uh were transported um by the organization who owned the trains to their new locations um and what we want to do is enable those to be turned into spaces for the community so we wanted some good to come out of what's been seen as as quite a negative um train uh over the past few years Okay, thank you very much. Um, right, Paul Ebert asks, I'm interested in the run Riding Sunbeams project. Can you expand, please? Yeah, so Riding Sunbeams are, um, they're sort of an arm of another organisation called 1010, who are, a, who are a climate change charity based in London. Um, and they've been working in the southeast to um, start these uh, small, uh, trackside renewables projects um, and they have been successful in implementing one uh, as I mentioned before it was a third rail project which is which is much easier than um, feeding renewables into overhead lines um, with the um, creation of the Core Valley Lines project Riding Sunbeams um, were able to apply for some funding from RSSB uh, to have a look at whether they're uh, technology and and their project could actually applied be applied to an overhead electrification um, but as I mentioned earlier unfortunately their timings didn't quite match ours in terms of um, the work that we're or our time scales that we're working on now um, but the feasibility study showed that this is something that can be done uh, we identified 36 percent of of the um, network can be um, utilised area around the network could be utilised for the placement of solar panels. Uh, we also identified uh, several large wind farms in the region that could potentially feed into a, into a trackside renewable scheme. Um, they are going to test, once the converter um, has been built, they are going to test this on the main line. Uh, they're just looking for a suitable location. Um, so it will be um, a cantilever style overhead electrification uh, mass that's supplied onto the um, existing overhead electrification somewhere near seven tunnel junction potentially um, and then that will be tested for safety for around 18 months um, safety of course being paramount to anything that's supplied on the railway um, but this project does fit into the time scales for our northwest and southwest Wales metros and really electrification as opposed to hydrogen or alternative fuel is is the um, you know best way in which we can look at decarbonizing the rail network and so um, you know projects like this sort of innovative project are essential for us um, especially in areas where um, electrification may prove difficult in the future. Okay, thank you very much, Natalie. Right, sorry, Bill sorry, Andy. Sorry, Andy. Could I possibly expand on why I asked that question? Is that okay? Yes, you could. Uh, and it might be of interest to people. And I think permanent way institution can sort of work with the, uh, the whole railway infrastructure industry here because I think that's fantastic, uh, Natalie. Uh, in terms, of, and I've, I've 
been trying to help a local community rail partnership. Once you're in the rail industry, people know you and they, they want, to help, want you to help, which is great. Uh, and I, we've got a lovely, large south-facing embankment where I uh, where I live, and, and I've engaged with Network Rail and its South Western Railway where I live, uh, and said this is a great project, and it's all been negative, too difficult, uh, safe, health and safety, and all that. So uh, I think what you're suggesting suggesting is fantastic and I would uh, I think we permanent way institution can should uh, support you and I'd love to roll it out to sort of small community projects uh, and if people think I'm barking up the wrong tree please let me know but I think this is what we should be doing thanks for that that's been very encouraging okay. right. that's no problem I, I was just going to say that um, you know I think it's uh, great that people are able to identify areas like this I think there's a um, really good opportunity for um, those projects to also support the community or the community rail partnership. Um, so, you know, when where, where we can, we'd support the community to install those schemes and then we'd buy the electricity off them and then the money would go back in, into community benefit. Um, so, yeah, really, really interested to, to know more about it myself. Okay. Right, Bill Langsford. Um questions have you thought about the risk of flooding through the Gwent levels <laughs> um well, yes well aware of the flooding through the Gwent levels the um there are proposed um railway lines obviously and existing railway lines exist proposed new stations i should say such as cardiff parkway and into newport that have come out as a result of the um the black um, route, um, you know, the, the new M4 bypass um, being rejected um, and we're working really closely with our engineers to help them to understand that, you know, risks from flooding are going to happen much sooner than they expect. You know, when, when we talk about 2050 and potentially, you know, some of our assets will already be underwater. Um, you know, and, and they're talking about um, things that are being built in, in 2080 and they're saying, well, there won't be anything there to build on. You know, it's um, it's it's a really real threat. Um, and for us uh, in my team, you know, working on the sort of policy and climate side, um, you know, we have a job in convincing the engineers uh, to ensure that they understand um, the risks that, um, that climate change poses to them so that's that's really important for us okay thank you um natalie right um joan here he says hi natalie thank you very much for your presentation very informative i'm particularly interested to understand a bit more about climate change adaption and resilience can you explain a bit more about the standards or rules that are in use to guide asset owners in their decision making so currently we're using um the cp6 um documents that network rail have produced um the climate change adaptation planning um we rely on a lot from science um such as the ipcc and the climate change commission reports we don't have our own standards and rules currently we're working on um our uh, SAMP, our Strategic Asset Management Plan, um, which is helping to um, guide our asset team in how they make decisions. Uh, and then our climate change risk assessments and adaptation plans will really embed into the organisation what we need to do. Okay. I, I noticed that, um, I mean, Wales has already started by starting building um risk of flooding into its building or its planning consents as well hasn't it yeah uh, so tan 15 was published um last week which is relatively new guidance um on on flooding um it will affect us we're just having a look at that ourselves sort of just picking it up and and having a look at that ourselves and how it's going to to impact our plans uh, but I believe it's um, one the first area in the UK to have this built in. So again, Wales sort of ahead of the curve on um, this sort of guidance. 
Thank you. Right. On, continuing on the subject of flooding, wait, Andrew Wilson asks, flooding of assets is a potential challenge to both old and new infrastructure. Can we be sure that key assets will not, such as the seven tunnel, um, which is protected by a historic berm, is high enough? And is the Taft's Well Depot similarly protected from possible flooding? <laughs> yeah, so um, I know that um, this, the seven tunnel junction, not, not one of our assets, but net, network rail assets, the, um, you know, the water is being removed from there at a significant rate all the time um not just in an extreme event i wouldn't wouldn't like to say um too much about what what they're doing i'm not not really sure on on um that particular stretch myself but uh, you know obviously very high risk particularly with the flooding that you know you can see on the flood maps of of cardiff um and newport already um in terms of the Taft's Well Depot, we um, it flooded in Storm Dennis, the site. The, our office flooded in Pontypridd, our brand new office. Um, our office in Forest flooded. <laughs> it's um, we're we're quite well aware of the impact. Um, we have put in measures to um, start to protect the assets, such as permeable paving, um, to help prevent surface water flooding. Um, we're well aware of the amount of storms um, that we are expecting um, to increase. Um, and so, uh, you know, constantly looking at options with um, Natural Resources Wales to ensure that um, this sort of flooding doesn't happen again. Though, you know, even on Wednesday last week, we've seen flooding in Pontypridd due to culvert blockages. Now that sort of preparedness work is going to be key to ensure that flooding like this doesn't happen. Um, the incident around Storm Dennis was um, due to a number of um, compounded impacts, the release of water into the TAF from, from the reservoir, for example, ensuring that um, we're prepared uh, when these types of incidents happen are really going to reduce the risk and that's why this collaborative working element is so important. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got another question um, I'd like to ask. There's been a lot of talk about um, different power supplies for different traction for traction um, on the railway. Um, I think there seems to be a lot of interest in hydrogen, but um, the results that have come out from the German railways indicate that battery seems to be a better option. So um, has um, Transport for Wales got any particular thoughts about um, um, perhaps our very rural routes where it's difficult to justify the uh, capital cost of electrification in the conventional sense? Um, about whether they're pursuing hydrogen or battery or, or a mixture of both or what? Yeah, I think um, it's it's a mixture at the moment. I think hydrogen shows great potential for the most rural areas in Wales. Uh, but then we mustn't forget that, you know, there are different ways of generating hydrogen and some of them are just as polluting as, as diesel is. And so if we were to pursue hydrogen, we'd want to ensure that that hydrogen is coming from clean sources. Um, and at the moment, uh, you know, th that doesn't currently exist. So, um, you know, uh, the renewable generation of hydrogen would be ideal for us, or if not, you know, a, a gas or energy from waste solution would would be sort of lower down down that um, list of potential, but um, you know it's it's definitely got to be considered an option. Battery technology is improving all the time. Um, we're involved in a number of university projects looking at battery development. Um, there are organisations out there um, such as Aston Martin, for example, and um, a number of um, manufacturers who are looking at um, solar air aircraft. Um, who are looking at um, battery technology that could be applied to trains as well. Um, and a lot of our new units where they um, are sort of by mode in that they can use diesel or electric, um, there's the opportunity to convert those trains to hydrogen um, or to battery in the future. 
So um, the target uh, at the UK level is no new diesel trains or no new diesel only trains by 2040. Um, so that's uh, what we're aiming for in the shorter term. Um, so yeah, we're we're looking at at those options of sort of various uh, multiple fuel use vehicles. Thank you. Right, another question from Joan. She says, not sure if this is a fair question, Natalie, but do Transport for Wales have any mechanism in place to gauge the level of support from the general public in pursuing climate change and decarbonisation? So we we don't currently have a mechanism in place. We are working on the science that um, we've been presented with and, and the policy that um, is being led by Welsh Government. I would say that in terms of um, the questions that we get from the public, um, we have had some um, in, you know, questions in that suggest that people aren't keen on the electrification or that they're displeased with the amount of devegetation that we're undertaking at the moment. So to install our overhead line equipment where um, removing vegetation between three and six meters either side of the track all along the core valley lines this is not just for safety purposes because um, you know obviously we want to keep the railway free from the risk of falling trees and slippery leaves and uh, the sort of things that affect service during autumn and winter uh, but yeah it's, it's also uh, so that we can in, ensure that people can't climb trees up to overhead masts or that um, overhead mast equipment isn't damaged by um, fallen trees either. And and so, yeah, we've we've received in, you know, um, information or, or questions from the public that suggest that they're not too keen on, on what we are doing. Um, but, you know, I'd say that's, you know, that's a very small amount of the questions that we get in um, and that um, generally you know people are really excited about the work that we're doing they're really excited to see the new trains arrive and um, the increase in services and um, I think whether or not that's sort of related to climate change for them you know it's going to be a huge benefit to Valley's communities not uh, only in a sort of a social and economic but also it'll improve local air quality uh, it'll be a much nicer environment for people to uh, travel and live in. Okay, thanks, thanks, Natalie. Um, I guess in, with those sort of things, it's getting people to look a bit further ahead than the fact that you've now cut down the recent growth of sycamores at the bottom of their garden. Yes. Right. Yeah, we um, we are. Um, I should say we are um, aiming for no net loss of biodiversity by 2024. So we will be replacing um, trees that we've removed. Yeah. Okay. Paul Paul Ebert asks, electrification. What electrification standards are being applied? And this might be slightly beyond your sort of area of um, expertise. <laughs> but are efforts being made? So what efforts are being made? To be efficient, i.e., not like the recent Great Western Railway electrification. Yeah, I can't. I can't say I'm an expert on this area. I know standards are being applied, and I know that it's gone through various um, engineering uh, and re-engineering um, to make sure that it's um, you know value for money and efficient. And um, yeah, I, I can't say too much. I'm not uh, aware of the GWR approach. I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, have we got any more questions? Well, that seems to be the end of the questions for now. Thank you, Natalie. Um, and I'd like to call upon Paul Ebert to propose a vote of thanks, please. Right, well, I'm using a uh, iPad, which is unusual for me tonight, uh, Natalie, but Thanks very much, uh, and uh, thanks for everyone attending. Uh, it's uh, really important, of course, that we all focus and understand uh, sort of sustainable development, as I like to call it, and it's rising in the uh, prominence of what you need to know, understand, and apply in terms of uh, applying for professional registration. As a lot of people know, I'm one of the professional development officers for the PWI. And uh, and I started my career in the 1970s, 
and uh, it, I confess that this is a challenge for me even. Uh, and uh, so any time there is a paper uh, about sustainable development, for me, it's of great value to the institution and everybody. And it's been a real sustainable development day for me because I've also attended a fantastic seminar this morning by the Permanent Way Institution, no, this afternoon, earlier this afternoon, about uh, efficient uh, electrification, which is why I asked the question, Natalie, uh, just to see if that can be applied and rolled out in Wales. Uh, and I think the PWI would be there to support transport for Wales in any value engineering. Uh, so uh, that's really prompted the grey matter for me. I was really excited about the uh, rainbow, what was it called, the <laughs> riding <laughs> sunbeams, and I would like to get in touch to find out how I can uh, promote that. I think that's, you know, even if for me, simple thing like that really uh, sort of uh, really, what I'd given up on, frankly, has really motivated me to go at uh, the stakeholders locally again and uh, i wish you well with your challenges i love traveling in wales uh, and i <laughs> love the coastal rides which i know andy uh, and andrew and others are more familiar with than me but now i think those coastal rides have got a significant problem in terms of maintenance so good luck with that uh, i really look forward to traveling on some of your electrified and hybrid routes and i think Andy, that was a great uh, paper for, for and promoted good discussion. Thanks very much. And uh, I'll ask everyone to thank in what we can try and do is unmute, do you, Andy, and uh, say thank you in the usual fashion? Yes, if you all unmute yourselves. Uh, 